Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the Australian Indonesian Gaukoma Lecture Series. And today's topic would be about the Gaukoma and myopia. I'm so glad that we have here with us Dr. Anthony Clark, Professor Morgan, Professor Widya Artini, Dr. Firna, and other consultants and ophthalmologists, as well as our beloved residents and registrar. And thank you for sparing your time uh, for this meeting. As our previous meeting, we will first have a case presentation from the resident, a lecture from the consultant, and then we will have time to discuss. Um, without further ado, I'm inviting Dr. Mega, our third year resident of Universitas Indonesia to present her case. Uh, allow me to share the screen. Yes. You may share your screen. Okay, so my, uh, is my presentation visible now, Doctor? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Doctor Mita, for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Mega Yuswati, and I am the third year resident from Univers uh, Universitas Indonesia. And tonight, I would like to present a case uh, about diagnostic challenge in uh, glaucoma in high myopia. So we have a case, a 28 years old uh, female presented to our glaucoma clinic complaining about blurry vision since one and a half years ago. She also, uh, beside the blurry vision, she also complained headache and narrowing of visual, uh, visual field that she de described as like looking to a keyhole. She had no prior laser or surgical inter intervention before and uh, she wasn't taking any ocular medication. She denied a uh, family history of glaucoma. And uh, she was uh, at that time in her fourth month uh, of TB medication. Uh, she had a uh, minus 10 dietary myop and minus two dietary astigmat in her right eye with a uh, visual equity of six over nine. And uh, Minus seven dietary uh, myop, uh, sorry, minus nine uh, dietary myop in left eye and minus uh, one and a half uh, astigmat in left eye with visual acuity of six uh, over 7.5. Her pressure were normal in both eye, 12 in the right eye and 16 in left eye. And the central corn uh, corneal thickness was uh, below average in both eye. Uh, she had open angles uh, on the gonioscopy and a normal exam and uh, didn't show any signs of secondary causes of glaucoma. Her optic nerve had uh, enlarged cup to this ratio in both eye with shallow cupping and nasalization in left eye. Uh, there was temporal peripapillary atrophy uh, in both eye, especially in the right eye. And the, uh, OCT or NFL thickness uh, examination shop showed a uh, supratemporal thinning at the left eye, uh, while the right eye was normal, and the ganglion cell layer analysis show a uh, thinning at the inferotemporal at the right eye. Her uh, first visual field examination uh, revealed like an abnormal visual field, but the result was unreliable because uh, the patient was unable to fix it during the examination. At the second uh, parametric uh, examination, uh, it also showed a visual defect and the patient uh, was able to perform better, but uh, it looks like a false negative, uh, maybe uh, probably because of the uh, refractive error. Uh, the operator also didn't uh, input the uh, refractive error data here. And because we know that uh, the parametric examination requires learning from the patient, we expect that uh, the result of the examination will be more reliable at her next visit. So based on that data, we diagnosed this patient with glaucoma suspect of the both eye, and we decided to start uh, giving the latanoprost. Uh, so uh, we know that myopia is a growing public health concern. And the global prevalence of myopia is predicted to increase to nearly 50% uh, and high myopia uh, to nearly 10% by uh, 2050. And uh, myopia increased the risk of uh, glaucoma as about sixfold increased odds of having primary open angle glaucoma. And with every one dietary, dietary increase in myopia will also increase the risk of having glaucoma by 20%. And the prevalence of glaucomatous optic neuropathy or GON was higher in high myopia. 
So with the increasing prevalence of myopia should result in an increased prevalence of POAG in the future. However, uh, it is a challenge to diagnose glaucoma in high myopia. So why is it, why is it difficult to diagnose glaucoma in high myopia? Ophthalmoscopically, it may be hard to distinguish myopia from a glaucoma because the effect of the globe elongation in myopia. So it's hard to uh, distinguish between myopic optics or glaucomatous optics. And then, uh, so we need uh, objective structural parameters to identify glaucomatous change combined with the parameter to detect corresponding visual field loss. However, there is multiple potential pitfalls in myopia. Uh, temporalization of the RNFL bundles in myopia will increase the odds of false positive RNFL thinning in the OCT examination. And also uh, the visual field defects uh, in uh, myopia and uh, may be attributable to either optic nerve or uh, myopic macular dysfunction. In, uh, we know that the glaucomatous optic disc can be classified into four types by the disc morphology. Uh, and the my, uh, one of these is myopic type and it's characterized by temporal tilting of the disc. And some characteristics are more prevalent in myopia, uh, uh, in glaucoma and myopia, such as optic disc tilt or cyclotorsion. And uh, myopic optic disc has highly deformed optic disc shape, disc shape and very popular structures and the deformation more severe with higher myopia. And uh, we also uh, have difficulty to identify uh, the uh, completely capped disc in myopic eyes because uh, the distance between the level of lamina cribosa and the level of the retina is much less in myopic eye. So in a completely capped disc in myopic eye, we'll have only half the depth of the usual glaucomatous cup. So it, it is uh, uh, difficult to identify. The other reason why uh, is it, it is difficult to detect the optic nerve damage in highly myopic uh, optic nerve uh, was rela uh, is related to, to the uh, axial myopia uh, elongation. And uh, it includes the, de the decrease of color contrast between the pink neuroretinal rim and the pale optic cup, the flattening of uh, the cup due to enlargement and stretching of the optic disc and lamina cribrosa. So it, it make uh, difficult to assess the neuroretinal rim and the bottom of the optic cup. And, uh, and there is an oblique view of the optic nerve head and difficulty in assessing the RNFL in peripapillary region. And also difficulty in distinguishing between the myopia related parapapillary gamma and delta zones and the glaucoma related histological beta zone. And uh, the prevalence of glaucoma optic neuropathy in high myopia was, uh, increases with the longer axial length in highly myopic eyes. And it can be found uh, for more than 50% in the extremely myopic group. There are some uh, factors that associated with the higher uh, glaucomatous optic neuropathy prevalence in high myopia, such as uh, secondary uh, macrodis and large parapapillary delta zone. In assessment of the RNFL thickness uh, in myopic patient uh, have a uh, limitation. Uh, first, the effect of uh, myopia are not considered in current norm normative databases. So it has been attributed to uh, somewhat uh, abnormal RNFL profiles in highly myopic eyes. And uh, myopic deformation of peripapillary structures uh, leads to failures in RNFL thickness measurement in some highly myopic uh, I, so it can, uh, we can find segmental errors in about 7% uh, of highly myopic eyes. In, uh, in, and in myopic eyes, the superotemporal and inferotemporal RNFL bundles tend to get closer together temporally, uh, since the angle kappa between the temporal vascular uh, arcade de uh, decreases with longer axial length due to the elongation of the fovea and optic distance. And because of this temporalization, when compared against the normative database, highly myopic non-glaucomatous uh, eyes may appear to have abnormally thickened RNFL temporarily, but abnormally thinning RNFL inferiorly and superiorly, and it uh, should be considered as a false positive. And the abnormalities of uh, in the RNFL profile become more prominent with increases in the, in the degree of the myopia 
uh, the axial length and optic disc tilting. So all of these features should be factors when uh, assessing uh, the peripapillary RNFL in a myopic eye. In myopic optic disc tilt, the diagnosis capabilities of temporal RNFL thickness were inferior to those in the non-tiltic disc group uh, in, in a study that uh, performed this uh, Shin et al. Uh, in, uh, for example, in the, uh, in the two cases of eyes with uh, superior field defects, and then uh, also the location of the RNFL uh, defect is uh, at the temporal in these two cases, one uh, non-tilted disc and one tilted disc. And the sectoral GCIPL thickness values are similar between these two cases. But uh, we can see that the clock hour ache uh, RNFL thickness uh, of the non-tilted optics, uh, non-tilted optic this eye was thinner than that the tilted optic this eye. And in the eye uh, with the tilted optic this, uh, while the temporal RNFL thickness does not reflect uh, the area of the RNFL defect, the sectoral GCIPL thickness can appropriately reflect this area. So the glaucoma darkness accuracy of uh, macular GCIPL parameter is unaffected by myopic tilted disc. In non-glaucomatous uh, highly myopic eyes, macular uh, layer structure is uniform regardless of the highly variable, variable myopia related optic disc deformation. Uh, macula is less affected by myopic globe elongation. Uh, usually the highly myopic glaucomatous eyes have an axial length uh, of less than 28 millimeters and often have symmetrical macular layer structure. Also in a uh, rare case, we can find excessive myopic globe elongation that leads to posterior staphyloma. Uh, with a uh, variable optic disappearance and very popular atrophy regardless of the uh, uh, visual field defect severity, we can see that the macula is uniformly symmetrical in eyes without uh, visual field defects. And uh, the retinal nerve fiber and uh, ganglion cell layer are thin in location that corresponding to visual field defects. And in a case of a high my, highly myopic eye with superior hemifield uh, defect, like in this picture, with no evidence of glaucomatous damage or on the disc photograph, RNFL photograph, RNFL deviation map, map or RNFL thickness map, the GCIPL deviation map and thickness map can be useful to indicate structural glaucomatous damage corresponding uh, visual field. However, there are some limitations to the ganglion uh, cell analysis. It is less useful when there is bipolar thinning of both uh, the superior and inferior at NFL. And with longer axial line, the stretching of the globe may result in a thinner macula. Therefore, use of a myopic database for GCIPL assessment is needed. And also a uh, myopic macular degeneration uh, may cause abnormalities at, uh, to the macula to the macular ganglion cell layer independent of the glaucoma. Uh, further consideration in evaluating the optic disc in myopia involves studying its vasculature. So various, uh, there are various lines of evidence that suggest uh, that the blood supply to the optic disc is altered with myopia. The retinal uh, vascular density is lower in glaucomatous eyes than in healthy eyes. And the magnitude of this, this, uh, this decrease in vascular density is correlated with the severity of uh, the visual field defect. Uh, in a study that uh, performed by uh, Lee et al., uh, they found that um, very popular vascular density as measured in, uh, with OCTA showed a topographical color correlation with visual field sensitivity loss in highly myopic uh, POAG eyes. So it could be useful adjunct to other structural tests, but uh, however, the clinical significance of uh, this exam, uh, this role of the vasculature uh, examination is uncertain because uh, ocular blood flow is not established as modifiable risk factor or therapeutic target for glaucoma. And the ideal method uh, for assessing the optic disc uh, vascular supply is also undetermined. Uh, and then the, uh, at the visual field assessment, uh, we know that visual field uh, 
forms the second arm uh, in the evaluation of glaucoma. In highly myopic eyes with structurally suspicious optics, the presence of uh, corresponding visual field defect may help to diagnosis. However, where there is a macular lesion and a uh, suspicious optics, it may be challenging to determine if the visual field defect is due to glaucoma or not. If there is a progression of visual field loss despite stable macular finding, uh, it could be a sign of worsening of the optic neuropathy. And the pattern or location of a progressive visual field defects may also offer clue to diagnosis. Uh, for example, if the central visual field defect is worsening, the area of uh, suspicion of the optic nerve is at the superior or inferior rim, uh, we need to look closely for structural progression at the macula because it is uh, probably more due to the myopia rather than the optic nerve from uh, glaucoma. There are also a uh, few specific considerations that need to be taken into account in the visual field assessment uh, of the myopic eye. First, uh, the pattern of visual field loss in myopic glaucoma may differ from non-myopic glaucoma. In non-myopic glaucoma, uh, early visual field defects are typically uh, at the pure uh, area defects and nasal stage. And uh, the center of visual field is often uh, spared until a late stage. However, in myopic glaucoma, there may more often uh, be early central or paracentral scotomas due to the increased uh, RNFL defects involving the papillomacular bundle. And as the uh, 24 to uh, as ITA program uh, in Humphrey Paramedic has poor performance in detecting central or paracentral visual field defects. It is warranted to perform 24 uh, to parametry with 10 to parametric combination for detecting central or paracentral visual field defects. And uh, also, we have to uh, consider the myopic refractive error itself because it can alter the outcome of the visual field testing. Uh, high power minus lenses may cause a prismatic deviation. And if visual field defects are found in myops on perimetry, uh, when the patient using trial lenses, it may be advisable to repeat the test using contact lens and vice versa. So uh, each test uh, has its limitation and potential sources of error that has to be considered in uh, glaucoma assessment in myopic eye. If one specific test is deemed unreliable in a specific myop, so another test could be used instead. Uh, for the conclusion, uh, the evaluation of glaucoma in myopic eye requires a multimodal approach. There is no simple answer to which is the best structural assessment for myopic glaucoma. Clinical examination techniques uh, such as ophthalmoscopy, uh, OCT, uh, parametry, and even tonometry can be unreliable in the detection of the glaucoma in high myopia. So understanding the limitation and potential sources of error of each test may allow the clinician to identify false positive or negative reports when they occur. This is the reference that I uh, use. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Mega. If anyone here want to ask or want to share thoughts or comments regarding the case, kindly type in the chat box and we will discuss it later after Dr. Clark's lecture. Uh, next, please allow me to introduce Dr. Anthony Clark. He is one of the consultant ophthalmologists at Alliance Eye Institute. He had his fellowship program in Toronto, Canada, and he specialized in glaucoma as well as pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus also. And Dr. Clark has a PhD in public health and continues his interest in epidemiology and clinical research, including glaucoma and childhood myopia. Um, please, Dr. Clark, uh, time is yours. Thank you, um, and thank you, Dr. Mega, for your um, interesting talk as well. Um, so I'll just share my screen. Um, 
Great. So I think Dr. Megan's covered most of my talk. I don't need to say very much now. <laughs> um, so today I thought I'd talk about um, the interplay between myopia and glaucoma. And it's always a challenging area, I think, for most of us um, who, who see glaucoma patients in trying to work out what's going on. Um, so hopefully um, through this talk, we'll um, sort of enlighten everybody on the changes that we see at the optic nerve head in particular in myopic patients um, and how those sort of changes occur, um, how they may um, be similar to sort of changes that you can see with glaucoma and some tips on how to um, differentiate the two. Um, so first we'll look at, uh, briefly have a look at the epidemiology of myopia and how glaucoma um, risk is associated with myopia. Um, briefly have a review for the residents and in terms of the glaucoma related optic nerve heads changes we, we typically look for. Um, also having a look at the optic nerve head changes in detail in particularly relating to myopic eyes. Um, have a brief discussion on the imaging challenges we have in assessing myopic eyes, particularly the optic nerve, and also um, a brief overview of some of the visual field changes you can see in myopia. So briefly, we know that myopia is becoming more prevalent, as Dr. Mega um, alluded to as well. Um, we're expecting about half the population in the next 30 years to be um, myopic and about 10% of, of that. Um, so about a billion people are expected to be highly myopic. So it's certainly a condition we're going to see more of and a, a conundrum we're going to um, be presented with more in the future. And glaucoma is certainly one of those conditions we know is well associated with myopia. This is the Blue Mountains Eye Study in Australia. Um, and in that study, the rates of uh, glaucoma in subjects with moderate to high myopia were, were about three, three times the um, odds compared to those um, who didn't have myopia. And certainly um, those, varies, those rates vary in, in other populations as well. But beyond just glaucoma, we know there's lots of other um, eye pathologies associated with myopia, particularly looking at um, macular um, uh, atrophy and degeneration, as well as posterior staphyloma, retinal detachment are all more common. And these are the, the blinding conditions that we worry about in pathological myopia at a young age. So the challenges in, in any patient with glaucoma is, is working out when you first see them, is glaucoma present? And that involves basically having a good knowledge of how to assess the optic nerve and what things you should be looking for. Um, so briefly, when you assess the approach your assessment of the optic nerve, it's important to be systematic. So initially you're looking at the disc margin. Um, is it clear? Um, are there areas of um, pigmentation or hyper or hypopigmentation? Um, any areas of peripapillary atrophy, for example? Um, what's the size of the nerve? Is it a big nerve? Is it a small nerve, a medium-sized nerve? That's important, when, particularly when assessing the cup. And what's the shape of the nerve? Is it a, a vertically oval nerve, which most of us typically have? Um, or is it more horizontally oval or, or torted? Um, and then looking also at the size of the cup in, in the optic nerve um, and in terms of vertical and horizontal cup to disc ratio is important. Then looking towards the neural retinal rim, um, class, um, typically we expect the inferior neural retinal rim to be the, the thickest and then follows the isn't rule where the superior nasal and then temporal neural retinal rims um, are um, um, changes in size. Um, then we look at the peripapillary um, pigmentation, looking at the vasculature, and then looking at the, the retinal nerve fiber layer. And in glaucoma, the, the typical patterns that we see do vary um, from concentric atrophy, where you get complete um, 360 degree um, generalized atrophy or cupping of the optic nerve head, relatively uncommon, I must say. Um, focal atrophy is the, the classic sign that you see, and that's a relatively easy sign to, to pick up when you see it, where you get um, focal loss of the neural retinal rim with associated retinal nerve fiber layer defect, as you can see in this photo. Um, in all the patients, you may get this sorcerized shallow cup that's slightly pale with all the senile sclerotic um, um, pattern of glaucoma. Um, and then you can also see deepening um, of the optic nerve cup where you get the, what's called the lamina dot sign, where you can see um, within the lamina proboscis the, the openings quite, quite clearly. 
Glaucoma related vascular changes are important. So particularly disc rim hemorrhages, which are certainly um, strongly associated with glaucoma and glaucoma progression, particularly in normal tensive glaucomas. Um, and they're also looking carefully at the, the, the vasculature from the optic nerve head. We often see bayonetting of the optic nerve head classically over the optic nerve um, rim. Um, you may see circumlunar vessel bearing where the underlying nerve um, fibers are, are sort of eaten away and the vessel looks almost like it's hanging in, in space. Vessels may be attenuated and you get generalized nasal displacement of the um, vascular trunk with progressive glaucoma damage. And looking uh, more specifically at the peripapillary region of the optic nerve, changes within the area that we call the beta zone atrophy are more specific for um, uh, glaucoma disc damage. And that's an important sign to be looking for is the progressive change in, in this beta zone area of atrophy. And I'll go into a bit more detail what that alludes to. Um, and then obviously these nerve, nerve bundle defects that you can see classic, um, quite clearly on this photo are very suggestive of glaucoma disc damage. So in, in myopia, interesting, most of the axial elongation as myopia progresses towards high myopia or pathological myopia occurs posterior to the equator. Interestingly, um, the scleral and choroidal thinning that's associated with that um, axial elongation um, around is, is mostly confined at that posterior segment. If you look at the pars plane, the scleral thickness, for example, the thickness doesn't vary with myopia severity to a great degree compared to the posterior segment. Um, and interestingly, the thickness of Brooks membrane um, across this, the eye doesn't actually change. It doesn't become thinner with axial um, progression. And that's led to the hypothesis that a lot of um, myopia, axial elongation related to myopia is, is felt to be driven by growth in Brooks membrane. And in fact, the Brooks membrane volume across the eye changes. And, and grows and then leads to uh, scleral thinning and in severe cases, um, posterior staphyloma. So in the myopic optic nerve head, what sort of changes do we see? Well, if you look at the orientation of the nerve, often they're tilted um, and that can be along the vertical axis um, more commonly, which we see, but it can be horizontally and even obliquely. The shape, size and shape of myopic optic nerves, they tend to be enlarged optic nerves and reasons we'll discuss in, in a couple of slides. And there's increased ovalization in the optic nerve head shape. Um, and this is all related to the stretching of, of Brooks membrane over time. Often as myopia progresses in severity, there's increasing pallor of the, of the optic nerve head and increasing um, or decreasing thickness or, or um, de depth of the, the cup. So the very myopic optic nerves can often be quite markedly shallow. The neural retinal rim can often be quite difficult to appreciate very clearly in very myopic eyes. But if you look at the um, neural retinal rim, particularly with newer sort of definitions with mean rid, um, minimum rib, rim width um, defined by Brooks membrane, it still follows the isn't rule, which is a useful, um, a useful thing to look at when, when deciding if some, some change is glaucomatous. We see significant peripapillary atrophy in myopic eyes. So classically, you get that temporal crescent associated with um, exposure of the underlying scleral tissue, which we, has been coined a gamma zone atrophy. Um, and the vessel changes that we see is often um, mimics glaucoma in some way in that you get significant nasalization of that central vascular trunk with increasing um, axial length. So why do we get optic nerve tilt? Um, it's essentially due to a displacement of Brooks membrane opening um, to the underlying um, scleral opening. You get essentially um, temporalization of the, the Brooks membrane opening, um, which causes a nasalization movement of the optic nerve head. Um, you can see in this photo with a, a um, straight on optic nerve with no tilt, um, you can see um, Brooks membrane opening overlaps pretty much with this, this scleral opening, but with increasing progression of, of myopia and increasing axial length, the Brooks membrane opening tends to, to um, move um, temporally. 
and that exposes underlying um, scleral tissue, which is what then causes this peripapillary atrophy that you can see temporarily on the optic nerve head. But as the Brooks membrane's moving um, essentially temporarily across, it's overhanging the nasal margin of the optic nerve. And it gives this tilted appearance because you've got that overhang and then exposure of the, um, the, um, the temporal margin of the optic nerve, which gives that then ovalized appearance. There's various, um, with increasing axial elongation as well, you tend to get thinning and that can have um, various patterns. It's not uniform at all. Um, you can get just an oblong shaped eye, as you can see in this um, D, D picture here. Um, they can just be generally bulbous at the back. You can get out pouchings with posterior staphyloma. Um, but interestingly, a lot of um, myopic eyes tend to be symmetrical in their appearance in terms of the pattern they, they follow with um, deformation of the posterior aspect of, of the globe. So you can imagine if you've got so much deformation at the posterior aspect, it's going to change the way that the, um, the optic nerve head is configured and the posterior pole um, measurements that you get with, with, with testing which um, significantly confounds any results that you see. This is just a photo just to illustrate the, um, the previous diagram, just um, to show what we're talking about in terms of um, that tilting of the optic nerve. You can see in the photo A without any overlying, the um, nasal edge of the optic, optic nerve um, looks nice and crisp. And you've got quite a large um, temporal uh, crescent of the optic nerve. And the anterior scleral opening sort of has that um, really cut off um, appearance. Um, and you can, as it's been exposed um, by the, the migration of Brooks membrane opening, opening in the temporal um, direction, the distance between Brooks membrane opening and the anterior scleral opening is that the area that we call the gamma zone atrophy, over here of gamma zone, which is, um, slightly different to, to beta zone atrophy and it's difficult to sort of completely um, separate the two clinically um, just looking through the ophthalmoscope. So the changes that we can see um, in myopia include at the peripapillary atrophy level include um, beta zone atrophy as well as this area that um, is temporal to beta zone atrophy which is called alpha zone atrophy. We also see gamma zone atrophy, which is distinct from beta zone atrophy. And it's important to note, note the distinction because we know that beta zone atrophy is independently associated with glaucoma and glaucoma progression. Whereas gamma zone atrophy as an entity in itself is more associated with axial um, elongation, more so than actual uh, glaucoma risk. Um, so how do we differentiate the two if we don't just, um, if we can't differentiate the two on the ophthalmoscope? The way we do that is basically with OCT. So we can see from this um, diagram that um, in terms of what defines alpha zone atrophy, um, that's basically designed, um, defined by um, irregularities in the retinal pigment epithelium, but with an intact Brooks membrane underlying and an intact uh, choroid. So you get sort of um, varying um, levels of pigmentation when you look at it um, ophthalmoscopically. Um, the area of what we call beta zone atrophy is where you get complete loss of the RPE um, with underlying Brooks membrane exposed. And as I said, this is the, the type of atrophy that we see um, typically associated with glaucoma. Gamma zone atrophy is basically that, that, that region of atro um, peripapillary atrophy where the Brooks membrane is absent and you just have underlying varying levels of chor choroid um, and uh, scleral um, tissue um, shown. So we can see that on OCT here, where with the benefit um, on the red free, it's very difficult to be able to, to differentiate the areas, but with the benefit of the OCT image, you can see um, quite clearly where Brooks membrane um, ends. And so we have that area of um, uh, gamma zone atrophy then you can see that RPE sort of finishes pretty much where the blue arrows um, start and that's that beta zone atrophy. And then you have um, varying changes in the, the degree of um, RPE and that's what we've classified as the alpha zone atrophy. So um, OCT is quite helpful in, in de defining those zones. 
So interestingly, myopia, the changes that we see in peripapillary atrophy as myopia progresses um, does progress in itself as well. Um, and certainly um, the temporal market crescent does tend to um, um, increase in size with the nasal shift of the um, myopic optic nerve. And you can see in these two cases um, from a case study published in ophthalmology of myopic um, children um, followed over, over time. And, and basically, um, particularly on case two, you can see the area of peripapillary atrophy increasing in size with increasing um, nasal displacement of the optic nerve or essentially um, temporal shift of the Brooks membrane opening. So these are changes that we see with axial elongation. Um, and it's important to realize that a, in, in eyes with myopia, um, it's a dynamic changing um, um, process and it's not um, a stagnant thing. So it's important not to confuse changes that you may see in peripapillary atrophy um, with potential glaucomatous um, change. And this is just another um, photo, just showing um, the changes we can see. And these are five-year-olds. Um, one is uh, adolescent, eh? and this is a five-year-old girl. Um, and you can see that over time, you've got significant um, increase in the size of that temporal um, crescent and um, ovalization of the optic nerve with progression of their myopia over three years. Um, and similarly, um, in, this, in this case, you've got increased horizontal ovalization of the optic nerve head as well. So tilted optic nerves are qu quite a characteristic feature of highly myopic eyes and certainly in pathological myopia. And as I, I said before, they don't necessarily have to be tilted on the vertical axis. They can be tilted on the horizontal and oblique axis and can also be um, uh, on, rotated on the sort of the Y axis as well. And it makes interpreting any um, retinal nerve fiber layer quantitative analysis really challenging because it doesn't obey any normal anatomical um, um, features that you would see in any normal to database. And so you really can't interpret it with any um, reliability, particularly on, a, on the first uh, visit um, scan that you would do. In very um, 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 severe myopia, often you, the stretching of the Brooks membrane, enlargement of the, the Brooks membrane opening continues to progress. So that essentially the overhang of the nasal border of Brooks membrane opening, it stretches out and it starts to, to expose um, the underlying sclera on the nasal border. And essentially with associated with shallowing of the optic cup and you get this acquired myopic megalodisc as it's been coined. And often they can be associated with significant posterior staphyloma. They're very large nerves, they're very pale. Um, trying to work out where the nerve fiber layer is on these nerves is almost impossible with the naked eye. It's a, a significant challenge. And these are themselves independently associated with glaucoma. And they've got a high risk of developing um, glaucoma. And that's probably related to the fact that in, in association with expansion of the Brooks membrane opening, there is significant distortion and stretching and thinning at the level of the lamina fibrosa. Um, and, and that's felt to be um, a, a strong um, um, factor involved in, in causing sort of glaucomanous or glaucoma-like um, um, nerve fiber damage and uh, glaucomanous sort of field defects. And in terms of um, its risk, we know that those acquired megalodiscs are associated with um, it's increased risk of glaucoma compared to other myopes of at least three times um, more than, 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 than the standard sort of myopic um, optic nerve. They affect about 30% of um, myopic nerves and depending on the study you look at, but in pathological myopia, the megalodiscs are about a third of them. Most have normal sized discs and also you can actually have quite small tilted optic nerves, which affect about 20% of the population, but that, that, that population, but they're not, both those and normal sized optic nerves aren't um, associated with an increased risk of glaucoma. So as I was alluding to before, those large nerves are significantly associated with glaucoma and that's associated with this sort of stretching in the lamina cribosa. And that's shown by this good um, histological 
um, comparison between a normal optic nerve head with associated OCT imaging and this very um, stretched enlarged um, optic nerve head seen in, in a pathological myopia with glaucoma. Um, the blue arrows here indicate the level of the lamina cribosa, and you can see it's nice and thick. And um, you can also see on the OCT, um, the, the lamina cribosa, um, uh, just down in this region here. Whereas um, in, in this photo, the lamina cribosa is very stretched and, and thinned out in this histopathological slide. Um, so significant distortion occurs with these, these type of discs, which is an independent association with glaucoma. So imaging in myopic eyes is really challenging and it's important to try and realize, I think you're best to interpret these images that you get, particularly with high, highly myopic eyes with a lot of caution. Um, and it's important to be aware of the significant sources of um, artifact um, and, um, and false negatives that can occur uh, that can occur um, with these, um, with particularly with OCT, OCT imaging. So, as um, was discussed before, myopia is often associated with significant temporal displacement of the retinal nerve fiber layer bundles as they enter the optic nerve. They usually occur just off the superior border of the optic nerves, um, inferiorly and inferior, um, and the inferior border. Um, but with increasing myopia, they, they displace significantly temporally. And there's no real good, there isn't a good normative database of myopes in a lot of these um, um, imaging systems. And so they tend to overestimate um, the degree of superior and inferior thinning um, in, in myopic nerves. So certainly as a, um, you've got to interpret those green and um, red plots on the, uh, the OCT printouts with quite a lot of caution. You've got to remember that centration is also can be quite difficult in very distorted, um, highly abnormal myopic eyes. And so, again, interpreting the RNFL printout related to the normative database um, is going to be quite difficult. Certainly with tilting of the optic nerve head, the OCT can have significant troubles trying to focus properly on, on the optic nerve. And so you'll get um, varying quality of scans around the 300 to 60 degrees of the retinal nerve fiber layer analysis. So it's important to make sure that um, the scan's technically been done um, correctly when you're, when you're examining it. Magnification varies quite a lot with axial length. And we know that with um, myopic eyes where you tend to get um, mag uh, significant um, increase in the RNFL um, circle diameter and increase um, or underestimation of the, the actual thickness of the RNFL, it measures thinner than what it truly is. Um, there's often issues with segmentation errors in myopic eyes because of that thinness, thinness in, the, in the tissue. And really the lack of a normal normative myopic database um, limits a lot of the um, analysis software that they, these systems often will, will use to judge glaucoma risk. So I think, um, they have their use, but particularly over serial measurements in the same person, you can probably be, be more happy that um, changes that may occur would be more telling um, on the same person, but just as a, 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 um, a, a one-off sort of um, a, a assessment of risk of glaucoma in one scan, you want to really be very careful in interpreting that. So this is just to dis describe the, um, or just show that temporalization of the retinal nerve fiber layers shown it um, in our previous talk with Dr. Meg, but you can see um, on, on these um, RNL thickness maps that you've got a significant sort of um, temporal angulation in an RNFL bundle. Um, and that's just been shown on the, the probability plots to show that the significant inferior thinning on the RNFL quadrant on the, on the left side, that's purely because the RNFL bundle has been displaced. Um, so, uh, um, it's, it's important, and you can see on the um, RNFL temporal, um, the T-SNP plot, that it's uh, you get that, that sort of temporal displacement of the of the peaks of the RNFL bundle. So you have to be careful that um, you 
this is to show evidence um, to show the challenges with getting the uh, the whole optic nerve on a tilted disc in the frame of of the scan. This is this is an example of a nerve where the um, the tilt was so so significant it was almost outside of the, the focal range of, of the scan and it's chopped a piece of the the um the analysis off in the center and it's then shown up as a an area of abnormal thinning so if you were to recenter that scan um, and redo the the analysis often that that would that should sort of disappear so it's just important to, to to look carefully particularly at the raw image that's quite useful to see to make sure there's not been any um, technical challenge in 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 um taking that the picture so you don't over um over analyze the uh the the red and green pictures there um to 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 fool you into thinking there's significant damage the um the other thing is um what can be the rnfl thickness maps are obviously significantly um affected by peripapillary atrophy um and so it causes significant problems with segmentation because there's loss of the, the RNFL in that area. So one option is just to use a wider RNFL circle, um, if you can, on your on your system, and certainly on the um, on the Spectralis machine, you can. Um, the other option is to use the uh, the Brooks membrane opening minimum width analysis, which is obviously um, not affected as much by this um, this artifact. So the Brooks membrane minimum opening width uh, measurement is um, was basically uh, designed or um, purported to be used to provide a more um, anatomically um, an anatomical basis for measuring the um, neural retinal rim, basically, and it's the distance between Brooks membrane opening and the um, internal limiting membrane for 360 degrees around the nerve. And it has a sem similar sensitivity overall in myopic eyes that di um, in diagnosing glaucoma um, with this 90% specific specificity. Um, and it's, it has less false positives um, in, um, in, in over calling glaucoma in non glaucomatous myopes compared to RNFLs. Um, the PNRFL um, tend to um, uh, overcall it by about 60% compared to, to the um, minimum width, rim width, and that's related to this peripapillary atrophy mostly. Look, there are limitations in, the, in, in this particular measurement. Um, if you've got temporal migration of the Brooks membrane from the disc border, it does lead to a falsely large optic disc size, which increases decreases the neural retina rim thickness as well. Um, and you can't really, it's, Often, if you've got a significantly high myope, it's very difficult to um, to make out the Brooks membrane opening. You can have areas of segmentation, of segments of the optic nerve head where you just you just can't can't see it, or and it's picked up abnormally as well. Um, so it's got its uses, um, but still, it's a challenging um, in even in, in um, high myopes, it's they've, they're, it's a challenging one to to use um, 100%. Um, the ganglion cell in a plexiform layer thickness um, is, has significant utility in, in, in myopes, particularly if you have a very abnormal optic nerve head, which is very distorted and, and uh, analyzing that becomes very challenging. And as we've um, seen previously um, from Dr. Meg's talk, the, the, um, um, the, the importance of tilt on causing um, false um, positives in, in, in the RNFL scan. Whereas you don't, it's the um, ganglion cell in a plexiform layer thickness at the macula, it tends to be not affected by um, optic nerve, nerve tilt or um, rotation of the optic, optic nerve. And when you look at the hemifield analysis software, um, it has a good, pretty good sensitivity and specificity for detecting glaucoma. But again, in myopes, it's got significant limitations. A lot of high myopes have a very regular mac macula region as well due to pathology. Um, there's a limited normative database as well. We know that maculas in myopes are abnormally thinned just from the fact that they're, they're, they're very myopic. And in itself, it may be difficult to segment as well. And there's often significant coexisting um, pathology that limits the usefulness of, of it as a scan. 
Visual field, field defects in myopia are another area of challenge. And certainly they're quite common, um, particularly with tilted optic nerves. We knew we, in the, the Blue Mountains uh, study cohort, 90% of, sorry, 19% of the uh, 62 tilted discs in that cohort had visual field, field defects. The classical visual field defects you typically see myopia with tilted discs are the superior temporal um, defects, as you can see in, in, in this photo here. It's usually a peripheral um, defect. It doesn't typically um, respect the vertical midline and often doesn't respect the horizontal midline either. Um, and often they, um, they, they can slowly progress um, over time in myopes as well. The second most common area is a just a, a, a small superior um, defect. And then in any area of the visual field can, can be affected with uh, myopic, dis, um, myopic uh, changes, including the temporal, infrotemporal, inferior and superior nasal aspects of the visual field. Um, so there's no specific area that um, is, is uh, classic for, for myopia, um, other than the superior temporal area really Certainly generalized reductions you see quite commonly, particularly in high mopes. Um, and that's probably a refractive effect. And so it's important um, to make sure that the, 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 the glasses are, are correctly worn or, if, or even consider contact lenses when, when popping them on the field machine, because um, you get significant um, reduction in sensitivity um, with increasing refractive error. Um, and large blind spots are quite common in, in, in pathological myopia. Um, and uh, um, the thing to note about um, myopic type visual field defects is they usually don't respect the horizontal um, midline, unlike glaucoma, which should, ex should respect the horizontal midline, and unlike uh, neurological defects, which would respect the vertical midline. Um, they're not always static, um, and they certainly can be progressive, even in the absence of glaucoma, although any progression is typically very slow. Um, rather than being sort of quickly progressive field defects. Um, this is a study published by um, Ding et al. Um, using um, the Zhongsheng Ophthalmic Center uh, that had a, a myopia registry. And they've got about a thousand eyes on this registry and they looked at the visual field defects among the myopes in, in this registry. Um, now this includes potential um, myopes with glaucoma, although it hadn't been formally diagnosed. But you can see that um, a very small proportion had a completely normal visual field. So visual field defects in, in high myopia is really common. Um, the most common uh, air, um, defects that you see is about, which affects a quarter of, 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 of the cohort was um, the enlarged blind spot, followed by a generalized reduction in sensitivity on the visual field defect. But what's quite interesting is these typically glaucomatous type defects with nasal step, early arcuate defects, or even advanced arcuate defects affected overall as a group 16% of, of, of that cohort. And when they took into account RNFL changes plus intraocular pressure changes, only 2% overall were judged to be high risk glaucoma groups, which meant that there was a significant proportion who simply for, because of their myopia had these uh, glaucomatous looking type visual field defects. It'll be interesting to see what this registry shows over time, if they're progressive defects and truly are glaucoma or if, the, or if they're not. But certainly from case reports previously published in other studies, a lot of these visual field defects you see in young myopes typically don't change, or if they do, they change very slowly. Other types of visual field defects um, described include paracentral and central defects, which we classically see in uh, the normal tensive um, glaucoma, um, myopic, myopia related glaucoma defects as well. And interestingly, the classic tilted disc defects didn't affect a big proportion of that, that registry population. So to summarize um, and to um, not tell us anything we know or don't know already, but trying to diagnose glaucoma in a myope is quite challenging. Um, and that's because the optic nerve changes that we see are, are quite common in myopia. Visual field defects are very common in myopia. And those changes that we see at the optic nerve head and the visual field changes we see in myopia can have a significant overlap with glaucoma. Changes that we see at the optic nerve head associated with myopia may progress, although they may, it's often slow. Um, and we often use progression as a way of diagnosing glaucoma. 
So sometimes just in, in those cases where we just really have a, um, we're not quite sure if it's glaucoma or myopia, then watchful, watchful waiting is often the, the best way to go um, rather than being too aggressive with, with management, um, particularly in the early stages. So that's my presentation. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Clark, for the- That's okay. Yeah. Great, any questions? Uh, I think um, until now, there's no question yet in the chat box, but I have uh, some question for you, uh, a little bit maybe off uh, from your um, explanation, but I want to uh, know how, um, how much your consideration about the IOP because um, if uh, the patient uh, came with the glaucoma suspect but the IOP is in the low teens, it's like 11 or 12, will it um, decrease your suspicion for glaucoma or um, no? So um, the first thing you want to know is the central corneal thickness. Um, is that particularly thin or is it, or is it thick? Certainly, if they're the thicker cornea, then you'd be less um, concerned about that sort of pressure. Um, it's, it's certainly, um, myopes are often more likely to have glaucoma at lower pressures compared to um, non-myopes who have normal tension type glaucoma. So um, you'd certainly be, you wouldn't exclude glaucoma just because the pressure's in the normal range by any means. You can certainly have um, glaucoma developing in, in market patients where the pressures would be considered low. Um, often they're in the, the mid to high teens. Um, and so um, you may be more inclined to watch someone like that as a glaucoma suspect early on rather than sort of aggressively treating them. And so um, will you make an adjustment um, based on the uh, number or the, uh, the, the central corneal thickness, uh, such as using the conversion table like that or no. I don't. I don't personally um, make uh, other than making note: is it thick or thin? Um, and rather than using sort of nomograms, um, so certainly if they've got a, a thin cornea, I know that the the risk of glaucoma, um, even with a normal pressure, is increased. Um, but I don't um, adjust the the pressure um, to a different number based on a nomogram on the th central corneal thickness. That's just a, a personal preference. Thank you, Dr. Um, is there any question? Oh yeah, we have here two questions from our resident, uh, Dr. Nabila from Universitas Indonesia. Uh, the first question is why in the myopic eye, there is an increase in circle diameter? It's, it's purely a refractive thing. It's because the eye is longer um, and the, the circle of the, the, the refraction of the eye causes the, the circle to be longer. Um, it's got a set point. It's, it's designed to be on a certain uh, normal hemotropic eye. Um, so any variation out of that will, so a hypermetropic eye will typically have a smaller circle width. Um, and how can you predict the prognosis from the peripapillary atrophy in a myopic patient? Um, so really um, what we know from the peripapillary atrophy is that um, you can't, I'm not sure there's any studies that have looked at degree of peripapillary atrophy and prognosis um, of visual um, defects, but we know that beta zone atrophy in itself is an independent risk factor for glaucoma um, and increasing size of that beta zone atrophy it suggests, is suggestive of, of glaucoma, um, but I'm not aware of any um, studies or ways of predicting prognosis based on the size or um, change in that. I'm not sure if any if my other colleagues here are aware of any. Um, be interesting if you could. Can I can I comment on that question yeah, as well? Of course, Morgan, please. Oh, yeah, the peripapillary atrophy. Uh, there's that really interesting work by I think it's Otsu, the Japanese um, group who found that the subarachnoid space is expanded in regions of uh, significant peripapillary atrophy. It's almost as if the 
uh, subarachnoid space is spreading out against the back of the sclera. And also, in the space and the CSS space is and causing more compression of the tissue. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are, and thoughts are when I see the larger papillary, I'm certain that it will get worse. I'm pretty sure that the map function is going to get worse um, much more quickly. Um, I'm, I'm not confident necessarily about the judgment call on the glaucoma progression prognosis. Thank you, Prof. Mark. Thank you. Okay. And so um, the more important is, is it the progression of the um, do you get my question? for Morgan I mean uh, is it uh, the more important is it the progression of the the change of the uh, width of the beta zone over time or since the beginning when we see the beta zone is um, quite significant we can uh, more suspicious to the glaucoma that and it will progress um, I'm sorry, I, I, uh, yeah, sorry. I, I, if they haven't had a papillary atrophy who's highly myopic, I, my thoughts are that their prognosis, either from the glaucoma or from their maculopathy, is, is significantly worse. Uh, and, and you do get some patients who are highly myopic without a lot of peripapillary atrophy, which is surprising at times. I, I'm not sure if you, and they seem to do better, but unfortunately they seem to be in the minority of the high myopes anyway. Mm. Thank you. And that was a, lo it was a lovely set of talks, by the way. Um, your resident, Anthony, thanks very much for very clear. It's, it's a very difficult diagnostic problem. Uh, a little bit like optic disc drusen, when you know, it's almost like you suspect there are two pathologies, but they cause the issues and not sure which one's the dominant one often. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Uh, actually, we have uh, passed our time, but if there's any more comments from other consultants. Okay, mm -hmm. so I think um, before we close, uh, uh, would you mind to have uh, those with us? Uh, Mega or Dr. Winta will help. Hello, Dr. Tria. Hi, Mita. Hi, everyone. Hi, Tria. Oh. 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 Sorry. Hi. Sorry, I'm still on my. Uh, Dr. Mega, could you help maybe to take the pictures? Please count so uh, we'll make sure that we we'll smile. <laughs> so, uh, I'm Dr. Again, are you? Very good. Ah, hey, Whittier. Yeah. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. You look like you're in California or something like that. No, I'm already in Jakarta. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice to see you. Yes, uh, I will start to take the picture. So in one, two, three. Okay, so... Uh, I already taken it. Thank you, Dr. Mega. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Clark, Prof. Morgan, Prof. Ika, Dr. Tria, Dr. Firna, Dr. Ardiela, and all. Uh, I think we will meet again uh, next month uh, in the mid um, 
of the month, the second Thursday, second Tuesday. Okay, thank you everyone. Have a good rest. Uh, good night. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.